Hello everyone. Today we'll be reading the second part of the chapter, The Making of a Global World, from the Social Science Textbook in History for Class 10. Indentured Labor Migration from India The example of indentured labor migration from India also illustrates the two-sided nature of the 19th century world. It was a world of faster economic growth as well as great misery. Higher incomes for some and poverty for others, technological advances in some areas and new forms of coercion in others. In the 19th century, hundreds of thousands of Indian and Chinese laborers went to work on plantations, in mines and in road and railway construction projects around the world. In India, indentured laborers were hired under contracts which promised return travel to India after they had worked five years on their employer's plantation. Most Indian indentured workers came from the present-day regions of eastern Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, central India and the dry districts of Tamil Nadu. In the mid-19th century, these regions experienced many changes. Cottage industries declined, land rents rose, lands were cleared for mines and plantations. All this affected the lives of the poor. They failed to pay their rents, became deeply indebted, and were forced to migrate in search of work. The main destinations of Indian indentured migrants were the Caribbean islands, mainly Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname, Mauritius, and Fiji. Closer home, Tamil migrants went to Ceylon and Malaya. Indentured workers were also recruited for tea plantations in Assam. Recruitment was done by agents engaged by employers and paid a small commission. Many migrants agreed to take up work, hoping to escape poverty or oppression in their home villages. Agents also tempted the prospective migrants by providing false information about final destinations, modes of travel, the nature of the work, and living and working conditions. Often, migrants were not even told that they were to embark on a long sea voyage. Sometimes, agents even forcibly abducted less willing migrants. 19th century indenture has been described as a new system of slavery. On arrival at the plantations, laborers found conditions to be different from what they had imagined. Living and working conditions were harsh and there were few legal rights. But workers discovered their own ways of surviving. Many of them escaped into the wilds, though if caught, they faced severe punishment. Others developed new forms of individual and collective self-expression, blending different cultural forms, old and new. In Trinidad, the annual Muharram procession was transformed into a riotous carnival called Jose for Imam Hussein in which workers of all races and religions joined. Similarly, the protest region of Rastafarianism, made famous by the Jamaican reggae star Bob Marley, is also said to reflect social and cultural links with Indian migrants to the Caribbean. Chutney music, popular in Trinidad and Guyana, is another creative contemporary expression of the post-indenture experience. These forms of cultural fusion are part of the making of the global world, where things from different places get mixed, lose their original characteristics, and become something entirely new. Most indentured workers stayed on after their contracts ended or returned to their new homes after a short spell in India. Consequently, there were large communities of people of Indian descent in these countries. Have you heard of the Nobel Prize winning writer V. S. Naipaul. Some of you may have followed the exploits of West Indies cricketers Shiv Narayan Chandrapal and Ram Naresh Sarwan. If you have wondered why their names sound vaguely Indian, the answer is they are descended from indentured labor migrants from India. From the 1900s, India's nationalist leaders began opposing the system of indentured labor migration as abusive and cruel. It was abolished in 1921. Yet, for a number of decades afterwards, 
descendants of Indian indentured workers, often thought of as coolies, remained an uneasy minority in the Caribbean islands. Some of Naipaul's early novels capture their sense of loss and alienation. Indian Entrepreneurs Abroad Growing food and other crops for the world market required capital. Large plantations could borrow it from banks and markets. But what about the humble peasant? Enter the Indian banker. Do you know of the Shikaripuri Shroffs and Natukotai Chatiyars? They were amongst the many groups of bankers and traders who financed export agriculture in Central and Southeast Asia, using either their own funds or those borrowed from European banks. They had a sophisticated system to transfer money over large distances and even developed indigenous forms of corporate organization. Indian traders and moneylenders also followed European colonizers into Africa. Hyderabadi Sindhi traders, however, wandered beyond European colonies. From the 1860s, they established flourishing emporia at busy ports worldwide, selling local and imported curios to tourists whose numbers were beginning to swell, thanks to the development of safe and comfortable passenger vessels. Indian trade, colonialism, and the global system. Historically, fine cottons produced in India were exported to Europe. With industrialization, British cotton manufacture began to expand, and industrialists pressurized the government to restrict cotton imports and protect local industries. Tariffs were imposed on cloth imports into Britain. Consequently, the inflow of fine Indian cotton began to decline. From the early 19th century, British manufacturers also began to seek overseas markets for their cloth. Excluded from the British market by tariff barriers, Indian textiles now faced stiff competition in other international markets. If we look at the figures of exports from India, we see a steady decline of the share of cotton textiles, from some 30% around 1800 to 15% by 1815. By the 1870s, this proportion had dropped to below 3%. What then? Did India export? The figures again tell a dramatic story. While exports of manufactures declined rapidly, export of raw materials increased equally fast. Between 1812 and 1871, the share of raw cotton exports rose from 5% to 35%. Indigo, used for dyeing cloth, was another important export for many decades. And as you have read last year, opium shipments to China grew rapidly from the 1820s to become, for a while, India's single largest export. Britain grew opium in India and exported it to China, and with the money earned through this sale, it financed its tea and other imports from China. Over the 19th century, British manufacturers flooded the Indian market. Food grain and raw material exports from India to Britain and the rest of the world increased. But the value of British exports to India was much higher than the value of British imports from India. Thus, Britain had a trade surplus with India. Britain used the surplus to balance its trade deficits with other countries, that is, with countries from which Britain was importing more than it was selling to. This is how a multilateral settlement system works. It allows one country's deficit with another country to be settled by its surplus with a third country. By helping Britain balance its deficits, India played a crucial role in the late 19th century world economy. Britain's trade surplus in India also helped pay the so-called home charges that included private remittance home by British officials and traders, interest payments on India's external debt, and pensions of British officials in India. The Interwar Economy The First World War, 1914-18, was mainly fought in Europe, but its impact was felt around the world. Notably, 
for our concerns in this chapter, it plunged the first half of the 20th century into a crisis that took over three decades to overcome. During this period, the world experienced widespread economic and political instability and another catastrophic war. Wartime Transformations The First World War, as you know, was fought between two power blocks. On one side were the Allies, Britain, France and Russia, later joined by the US, and on the opposite side were the Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary and Ottoman Turkey. When the war began in August 1914, many governments thought it would be over by Christmas. It lasted more than four years. The First World War was a war like no other before. The fighting involved the world's leading industrial nations, which now harnessed the vast powers of modern industry to inflict the greatest possible destruction on their enemies. This war was thus the first modern industrial war. It saw the use of machine guns, tanks, aircraft, chemical weapons, etc. on a massive scale. These were all increasingly products of modern large-scale industry. To fight the war, millions of soldiers had to be recruited from around the world and moved to the front lines on large ships and trains. The scale of death and destruction, 9 million dead and 20 million injured, was unthinkable before the industrial age without the use of industrial arms. Most of the killed and mimed were men of working age. These deaths and injuries reduced the able-bodied workforce in Europe. With fewer numbers within the family, household incomes declined after the war. During the war, industries were restructured to produce war-related goods. Entire societies were also reorganized for war. As men went to battle, women stepped in to undertake jobs that earlier only men were expected to do. The war led to the snapping of economic links between some of the world's largest economic powers, which were now fighting each other to pay for them. So Britain borrowed large sums of money from US banks as well as the US public. Thus, the war transformed the US from being an international debtor to an international creditor. In other words, at the war's end, the US and its citizens owned more overseas assets than foreign governments and citizens owned in the US. Post-war recovery Post-war economic recovery proved difficult. Britain, which was the world's leading economy in the pre-war period, in particular faced a prolonged crisis. While Britain was preoccupied with war, industries had developed in India and Japan. After the war, Britain found it difficult to recapture its earlier position of dominance in the Indian market and to compete with Japan internationally. Moreover, to finance war expenditures, Britain had borrowed liberally from the US. This meant that at the end of the war, Britain was burdened with huge external debts. The war had led to an economic boom that is, to a large increase in demand, production, and employment. When the war boom ended, production contracted and unemployment increased. At the same time, the government reduced bloated war expenditures to bring them into line with peacetime revenues. These developments led to huge job losses. In 1921, one in every five British workers was out of work. Indeed, Anxiety and uncertainty about work became an enduring part of the post-war scenario. Many agricultural economies were also in crisis. Consider the case of wheat producers. Before the war, Eastern Europe was a major supplier of wheat in the world market. When this supply was disrupted during the war, wheat production in Canada, America and Australia expanded dramatically. But once the war was over, production in Eastern Europe revived and created a glut in wheat output. Grain prices fell 
rural incomes declined and farmers fell deeper into debt. Rise of mass production and consumption. In the US, recovery was quicker. We have already seen how the war helped boost the US economy. After a short period of economic trouble in the years after the war, the US economy resumed its strong growth in the early 1920s. One important feature of the US economy of the 1920s was mass production. The move towards mass production had begun in the late 19th century, but in the 1920s it became a characteristic feature of industrial production in the US. A well-known pioneer of mass production was the car manufacturer Henry Ford. He adapted the assembly line of a Chicago slaughterhouse, in which slaughtered animals were picked apart by butchers as they came down a conveyor belt to his new car plant in Detroit. He realized that the assembly line method would allow a faster and cheaper way of producing vehicles. The assembly line forced workers to repeat a single task mechanically and continuously, such as fitting a particular part to the car, at a pace dictated by the conveyor belt. This was a way of increasing the output per worker by speeding up the pace of work. Standing in front of a conveyor belt, no worker could afford to delay the motions, take a break, or even have a friendly word with a workmate. As a result, Henry Ford's cars came off the assembly line at three minute intervals, a speed much faster than that achieved by previous methods. The T model Ford was the world's first mass produced car. At first, workers at the Ford factory were unable to cope with the stress of working on assembly lines in which they could not control the pace of work. So they quit in large numbers. In desperation, Ford doubled the daily wage to $5 in January 1914. At the same time, he banned trade unions from operating in his plans. Henry Ford recovered the high wage by repeatedly speeding up the production line and forcing workers to work even harder. So much so, he would soon describe his decision to double the daily wage as the best cost-cutting decision he had ever made. Fordist industrial practices soon spread in the US. They were also widely copied in the Europe in the 1920s. Mass production lowered costs and prices of engineered goods. Thanks to higher wages, more workers could now afford to purchase durable consumer goods such as cars. Car production to the U.S. rose from 2 million in 1919 to more than 5 million in 1929. Similarly, there was a spurt in the purchase of refrigerators, washing machines, radios, gramophone players, all through a system of higher purchase, meaning on credit repaid in weekly or monthly installments. The demand for refrigerators, washing machines, etc. was also fueled by a boom in house construction and home ownership, financed once again by loans. The housing and consumer boom of the 1920s created the basis of prosperity in the US. Large investments in housing and household goods seemed to create a cycle of higher employment and incomes, rising consumption demand, more investment, and yet more employment and incomes. In 1923, the U.S. resumed exporting capital to the rest of the world and became the largest overseas lender. U.S. imports and capital exports also boosted European recovery and world trade and income growth over the next six years. All this, however, proved too good to last. By 1929, the world would be plunged into depression such as it had never experienced before. The Great Depression The Great Depression began around 1929 and lasted till the mid-1930s. During this period, most parts of the world experienced catastrophic declines in production, employment, incomes and trade. 
the exact timing and impact of the depression varied across countries. But in general, agricultural regions and communities were the worst affected. This was because the fall in agricultural prices was greater and more prolonged than that in the prices of industrial goods. The depression was caused by a combination of several factors. We have already seen how fragile the post-war world economy was. First, agricultural overproduction remained a problem. This was made worse by falling agricultural prices. As prices slumped and agricultural incomes declined, farmers tried to expand production and bring a larger volume of produce to the market to maintain their overall income. This worsened the glut in the market, pushing down prices even further. Farm produce rotted for a lack of buyers. Second, in the mid-1920s, many countries financed their investments through loans from the U.S. While it was often extremely easy to raise loans in the U.S. when the going was good, U.S. overseas lenders panicked at the first sign of trouble. In the first half of 1928, U.S. overseas loans amounted to over $1 billion. A year later, it was one quarter of that amount. Countries that depended crucially on U.S. loans now faced an acute crisis. The withdrawal of U.S. loans affected much of the rest of the world, though in different ways. In Europe, it led to the failure of some major banks and the collapse of currencies, such as the British pound sterling. In Latin America and elsewhere, it intensified the slump in agricultural and raw material prices. The U.S. attempt to protect its economy in the Depression by doubling import duties also dealt another severe blow to world trade. The U.S. was also the industrial country most severely affected by the Depression. With the fall in prices and the prospect of a depression, U.S. banks had also slashed domestic lending and called back loans. Farms could not sell their harvests, households were ruined, and businesses collapsed. Faced with falling incomes, many households in the U.S. could not repay what they had borrowed and were forced to give up their homes, cars, and other consumer durables. The consumerist prosperity of the 1920s now disappeared in a puff of dust. As unemployment soared, people trudged long distances looking for any work they could find. Ultimately, the U.S. banking system itself collapsed. Unable to recover investments, collect loans, and repay depositors, thousands of banks went bankrupt and were forced to close. The numbers are phenomenal. By 1933, over 4,000 banks had closed, and between 1929 and 1932, about 110,000 companies had collapsed. By 1935, a modest economic recovery was underway in most industrial countries. But the Great Depression's wider effects on society, politics, and international relations, and on people's minds, proved more enduring. India and the Great Depression If we look at the impact of the Depression on India, we realize how integrated the global economy had become by the early 20th century. The tremors of a crisis in one part of the world were quickly relayed to other parts, affecting lives, economies, and societies worldwide. In the 19th century, as you have seen, colonial India had become an exporter of agricultural goods and importer of manufactures. The depression immediately affected Indian trade. India's exports and imports nearly halved between 1928 and 1934. As international prices crashed, prices in India also plunged. Between 1928 and 1934, Wheat prices in India fell by 50%. Peasants and farmers suffered more than urban dwellers. Though agricultural prices fell sharply, the colonial government 
refused to reduce revenue demands. Pheasants producing for the world market were the worst hit. Consider the jute producers of Bengal. They grew raw jute that was processed in factories for export in the form of gunny bags. But as gunny exports collapsed, the price of raw jute crashed more than 60%. Peasants who borrowed in the hopes of better times or to increase output in the hope of higher incomes faced even lower prices and fell deeper and deeper into debt. Thus, the Bengal jute growers lament, grow more jute, brothers, with the hope of greater cash. Costs and debts of jute will make your hopes get dashed. When you have spent all your money and got the crop off the ground, traders sitting at home will only pay rupees five a mound. Across India, peasants' indebtedness increased. They used up their savings, mortgaged lands, and sold whatever jewelry and precious metals they had to meet their expenses. In these depression years, India became an exporter of precious metals, notably gold. The famous economist John Maynard Keynes thought that Indian gold exports promoted global economic recovery. They certainly helped speed up Britain's recovery, but did little for the Indian peasant. Rural India was thus seething with unrest when Mahatma Gandhi launched the civil disobedience movement at the height of the depression in 1931. The depression proved less grim from urban India. Because of falling prices, those with fixed incomes, say town-dwelling landowners who received rents and middle-class salaried employees, now found themselves better off. Everything cost less. Industrial investment also grew as government extended tariff protection to industries under the pressure of nationalist opinion. Rebuilding a World Economy The Post-War Era The Second World War broke out a mere two decades after the end of the First World War. It was fought between the Axis powers, mainly Nazi Germany, Japan and Italy, and the Allies, Britain, France, the Soviet Union and the US. It was a war waged for six years on many fronts, in many places, over land, on sea, in the air. Once again, death and destruction was enormous. At least 60 million people, or about 3% of the world's 1939 population, are believed to have been killed directly or indirectly as a result of the war. Millions more were injured. Unlike in earlier wars, most of these deaths took place outside the battlefields. Many more civilians than soldiers died from war-related causes. Vast parts of Europe and Asia were devastated and several cities were destroyed by aerial bombardment or relentless artillery attacks. The war caused an immense amount of economic devastation and social disruption. Reconstruction promised to be long and difficult. Two crucial influences shaped post-war reconstruction. The first was the U.S.'s emergence as the dominant economic, political and military power in the Western world. The second was the dominance of the Soviet Union. It had made huge sacrifices to defeat Nazi Germany and transformed itself from a backward agricultural country into a world power. During the very years when the capitalist world was trapped in the Great Depression. Post-war settlement and the Bretton Woods institutions. Economists and politicians drew two key lessons from interwar economic experiences. First, an industrial society based on mass production cannot be sustained without mass consumption. But to ensure mass consumption, there was a need for high and stable incomes.
incomes could not be stable if employment was unstable. Thus, stable incomes also required steady full employment. But markets alone could not guarantee full employment. Therefore, governments would have to step in to minimize fluctuations of price, output, and employment. Economic stability could be ensured only through the intervention of the government. The second lesson related to a country's economic links with the outside world. The goal of full employment could only be achieved if governments had power to control flows of goods, capital, and labor. Thus, in brief, the main aim of the post-war international economic system was to preserve economic stability and full employment in the industrial world. Its framework was agreed upon at the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference held in July 1944 at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, USA. The Bretton Woods Conference established the International Monetary Fund, IMF, to deal with external surpluses and deficits of its member nations. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, popularly known as the World Bank, was set up to finance post-war reconstruction. The IMF and the World Bank are referred to as the Bretton Woods Institutions, or sometimes the Bretton Woods Twins. The post-war international economic system is also often described as the Bretton Woods system. The IMF and the World Bank commenced financial operations in 1947. Decision-making in these institutions is controlled by the Western industrial powers. The U.S. has an effective right of veto over key IMF and World Bank decisions. The international monetary system is the system linking national currencies and monetary system. The Bretton Woods system was based on fixed exchange rates. In this system, national currencies, for example the Indian rupee, were pegged to the dollar at a fixed exchange rate. The dollar itself was anchored to gold at a fixed price of $35 per ounce of gold. The Early Post-War Years the Bretton Woods system inaugurated an era of unprecedented growth of trade and incomes for the Western industrial nations and Japan. World trade grew annually at over 8% between 1950 and 1970 and incomes at nearly 5%. The growth was also mostly stable, without large fluctuations. For much of this period, the unemployment rate, for example, averaged less than 5% in most industrial countries. These decades also saw the worldwide spread of technology and enterprise. Developing countries were in a hurry to catch up with the advanced industrial nations. Therefore, they invested vast amounts of capital importing industrial plant and equipment featuring modern technology. Decolonization and Independence when the Second World War ended, large parts of the world were still under European colonial rule. Over the next two decades, most colonies in Asia and Africa emerged as free independent nations. They were, however, overburdened by poverty and a lack of resources, as the economies and societies were handicapped by long periods of colonial rule. The IMF and the World Bank were designed to meet the financial needs of the industrial countries. They were not equipped to cope with the challenge of poverty and lack of development in the former colonies. But as Europe and Japan rapidly rebuilt their economies, they grew less dependent on the IMF and the World Bank. Thus, from the late 1950s, the Bretton Woods institutions began to shift their attention more towards developing countries. As colonies, many of the less developed regions of the world had been part of Western empires. Now, ironically, as newly independent countries facing urgent pressures to lift their populations out of poverty, 
they came under the guidance of international agencies dominated by the former colonial powers. Even after many years of decolonization, the former colonial powers still controlled vital resources such as minerals and land in many of their former colonies. Large corporations of other powerful countries, for example the US, also often managed to secure rights to exploit developing countries' natural resources very cheaply. At the same time, most developing countries did not benefit from the fast growth the Western economies experienced in the 1950s and 1960s. Therefore, they organized themselves as a group, the Group of 77 or G77, to demand a new international economic order, NIEO. By the NIEO, they meant a system that would give them real control over their natural resources, more development assistance, fairer prices for raw materials, and better access for their manufactured goods in developed countries' markets. End of Bretton Woods and the beginning of globalization. Despite years of stable and rapid growth, not all was well in this post war world. From the 1960s, the rising costs of its overseas involvements weakened the US's finances and competitive strength. The US dollar now no longer commanded confidence as the world's principal currency. It could not maintain its value in relation to gold. This eventually led to the collapse of the system of fixed exchange rates and the introduction of a system of floating exchange rates. From the mid-1970s, the international financial system also changed in important ways. Earlier, developing countries could turn to international institutions for loans and development assistance. But now, they were forced to borrow from Western commercial banks and private lending institutions. This led to periodic debt crisis in the developing world and lower incomes and increased poverty, especially in Africa and Latin America. The industrial world was also hit by unemployment that began rising from the mid-1970s and remained high until the early 1990s. From the late 1970s, MNCs also began to shift production operations to low-wage Asian countries. China had been cut off from the post-war world economy since its revolution in 1949. But new economic policies in China and the collapse of the Soviet Union and Soviet-style communism in Eastern Europe brought many changes back into the fold of the world economy. Wages were relatively low in countries like China. Thus, they became attractive destinations for investment by foreign MNCs competing to capture world markets. Have you noticed that most of the TVs, mobile phones, and toys we see in the shops seem to be made in China? This is because of the low cost structure of the Chinese economy, most importantly, its low wages. The relocation of industry to low-wage countries stimulated world trade and capital flows. In the last two decades, the world's economic geography had been transformed as countries such as India, China and Brazil have undergone rapid economic transformation. And that is the end of the chapter, The Making of a Global World. We will be continuing with the next chapter in the next video. Until then, stay tuned.